Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our series, Prototokos Mystery, Part 397. We're continuing with our lesson titled, War of the Seeds. This will be Part 3. Scripture teaches, during the tribulation period, the Prototokos saints will be divided into two groups. Those who are controlling events from the heaven of heavens, and those who are undergoing persecution in the lower heavens and the earth. Those in the heaven of heavens will witness the inhuman treatment of their brethren at the hands of the Luciferians in the lower heavens and the earth. Turn to Revelation 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. So we see the division here in the seed of the woman, the prototokos. Those who have been glorified and are at the preeminent position and those who are undergoing the uh, affliction of the enemy, the <clears throat> forces of darkness, in the lower creation. Turn to Revelation 18, verse 20. Rejoice over her, the heaven and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. So we find <coughs> that those who are left behind, <coughs> depending upon what they did to miss the rapture, depending upon how they died, will not be able to come to the level of those who've made the rapture, let alone their, their position. They're still in the angelic, I mean, they're still in the status of prophets and apostles. When they do <coughs> make heaven, mm -hmm. what's the, the difference in positions, the disparity? Is it significant? Yes. Night and day, literally. Yes, in this case, <coughs> the ones that's telling them to rejoice are those that uh, have made They've the made fullness it. of sonship. Right. The ones who are in the lower heavens are still in the position of apostles and prophets. So they would be considerably lower than the elders who've made the rapture? Yes. Okay. Yes. They failed to make the level at which they were meant to qualify. <coughs> Brings us to the next principle. Be <clears throat> scripture teaches those who missed the rapture because of their embracing Luciferian influences in the communities of the saints just before the rapture. In other words, the communities are going to be allowed to <clears throat> experience Luciferian influence. This enables the individual to experience temptation, which he must overcome to <clears throat> establish his position, the position of his calling. Revelation, the second chapter, verse 4 to 5. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first 
love. <coughs> now, the first love comes from Greek term protos, which means most important. Mm -hmm. So it says you've left your most important love. <coughs> Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. So what this <coughs> is uh, <coughs> giving us is that these have yielded to the Luciferian influence of slackening in your commitment to the Lord. And we should understand that that has become a habit with them now. Yes. A way of life, in other words. Yes. Okay. Remember what the Lord says, the prerequisite for a disciple. Mm. <clears throat> he who loveth father, mother, brother, above me is not worthy of me. Right. Now, they're still doing things they were doing before, mm. but they're not doing it motivated by the motivation they did it before, which in the eyes of the Lord is radically different. God looks at motive, not at action. <clears throat> what caused you to do what you did? Well, you notice what he's talking here about. What have they done? <clears throat> Verse 2, In other words, thy labor, thy patience, how thou canst not bear them, which are evil, thou hast tried them, and say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, is born as patience, and for my sake has it labored, and is not fainted. So they're still doing what they did before. But the motive is no longer there. They're not doing it because of the love relationship, the level of love that they once embraced. They're doing it now because they realize, even on the lower level, <coughs> they're desirous of maintaining righteousness, sanctity, all the things that a saint should embrace. But the motive is no longer there. First love is no longer there. And to the Lord, even though they're doing these good things, because they've left the relationship they had once had with him, in his eyes, they're considered to be backslidden, fallen. Therefore, they're going to miss the rapture. <coughs> Revelation 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Now, what we see here is they have fallen into a lifestyle based off of greed. Balaam was a prophet. The only, the only Gentile prophet I, I see in the Bible. And the scripture talks about him and the things that he did, which are the same things that they are doing. Turn to 2 Peter, 2 chapter, verse 15. <coughs> Second Peter, second chapter, <coughs> verse 15. Which have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He was greedy. He was covetous. He wanted worldly wealth. And we see the degree of what he did to get it. Turn to Numbers 31. I'm going to read verses 6 to 18. instructed by the Lord to send Israel into battle. 
Verse 6, Moses sent them to the war, a thousand of every tribe of them. And Phineas, the son of Eleazar the priest, to the war, with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites, as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males. And they slew the kings of Midian, beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi, Rechem, Zer, and Hur. And Reba, five kings of Midian, Balaam also the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. And the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captives and their little ones and took the spoil of all their cattle, all their flocks, and all their goods. So what happened was they invade Midian, wipe out... <clears throat> The men, the warriors, they leave the women and the children and take them captive back <coughs> to uh, the camp. And they burn all their cities wherein they dwelt and all their goodly cast castles with fire. And they took all the spoil and all the prey, both of men and of beasts. And they brought the captives and the prey and the spoil unto Moses and Eleazar the priest and unto the congregation of the children of Israel unto the camp of the plains of Moab, which are by the Jordan near Jericho. Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp. Moses was wroth, he's angry, with the officers of the host, with the captains over thousands, captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. And Moses said unto them, Have you saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel do the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. What happened was Balaam <coughs> persuaded the king <coughs> to have the women go out and lure the Israelites into illicit relationships. And that brought reproach upon the whole nation. And what happened was you had infiltration of a spirit of whoredoms into the nation with Israelites committing uh, uh, illicit acts <clears throat> with these women, same women that they took captive. And Moses was angry with them. He said, because <clears throat> of what these women did, God came down and smote something like 20, 30,000 Israelites and they stopped them dead in their tracks from progressing any law anymore toward the promised land until repentance came, until they get their act together. And Moses is telling the, the generals here, you're doing the same thing over again under the influence of Balaam. Balaam taught these women how to seduce our men. And he goes on, to say, <clears throat> verse 17, Now therefore kill every male among the little ones, in other words, their children, <clears throat> and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. But all the women children, the girls, that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. So he's telling them you have to wipe this thing out now, because if you don't, it's going to plague us all over again. This is the teaching of Balaam. This is what's happening in <clears throat> the communities of the saints. You're having rampant fornication, adultery, at the behest of the leadership. Go back now to Revelation. Second chapter. <clears throat> this type of thing is... is is literally by the time of this writing it's literally rampant <clears throat> revelation second chapter verse 20 <laughs> this is the church of thyatira now this is going to be an interesting judgment <laughs> Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, 
which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her a space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth, searcheth the reins and horns, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Now what is he saying here? It's a judgment. <clears throat> He's saying, Behold, I will cast her into a bed. He's going to uh, lay her down on a bed of affliction, and she's going to die on that bed. And them that commit adultery with her, in other words, she has a great following, massive following. And the way that she keeps the following is through illicit sexual acts. From what is being said here, this, these, these guys have committed fornication and they've sired many children by this woman. This is the degree of corruption that's taken place at this time in the communities. But he makes a statement here concerning the people that are following her. It says, <clears throat> I'll cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Great tribulation tribulation. They're going to miss the rapture. They're going to survive until the time of the beast where great tribulation takes place. And he says he's going to use that. Notice what he goes on to say. I'll kill the children with death and the churches will... All the churches shall know. All the churches. The global church community is going to know about this. All the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins in the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So these people are going to suffer so egregiously that by the time the, of the ending of the Great Tribulation, all the churches, the assemblies, those that are surviving are going to know what happened here, and they're going to, this is going to be so egregious to them that they are going to turn in repentance to God. Turn to Revelation 7. Revelation 7, 9 to 10. Revelation 7, we're going to start with verse 9 to 10. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. This is the remnant of all the churches. They cover every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. They have come out of great tribulation. Now we're going to go down to <clears throat> two things. And cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb. Now, <clears throat> why are they crying salvation? The word salvation comes from a term, Greek term soteria, and in this case is meaning deliverance. What are they saying? They're making a proclamation to the Lord, thanking Him for delivering them out of great tribulation. <clears throat> and then it goes on. <clears throat> At this point, the angels, the elders go into a, a, an atmosphere of worship. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne in their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing, glory, wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. One of the elders answered, 
saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, basically what he's telling them is where they come from. These are the churches that have been um, persecuted, tormented since the time of the rapture. They have one thing to say to the Lord. They thank him for their deliverance out of the hell yes. that they have been experiencing. The pure, unadulterated torment. Mm -hmm. The crowning experience that they have is I've seen what happened to the followers of Jezebel in the church community. The, the, whatever happened to them in the tribulation period was an a judgment leveled upon them by the Lord in which they suffered tremendously at the hands of the Luciferians. So much so that these people were influenced by it, totally repented, totally acquiesced to the Lord and washed their robes and made them white. So you see interactions taking place between the time of the communities and the time of the tribulation period. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we want to take a quick look here at the condition the Lord is talking about. Go back to Revelation, second chapter. What is happening here is the Lord has allowed the Luciferian influence to enter into the church communities to try them to see if they will qualify for the rapture. What we have found here In the space of the woman who is very influential in the community of Thyatira, the inference is that she at one time was a genuine prophetess and had <clears throat> done many gracious things and had a reputation. But when the Luciferian influence was allowed to infiltrate the communities, she became corrupted and turned from initially being committed, initially being uh, a vessel that was genuine to a total corrupted harlot. Should we understand that Jezebel didn't infiltrate because she was originally part of the community? She's part of the community, yeah. But the influence... Time the Luciferian influence, which was allowed to infiltrate, mm -hmm. corrupted her. And then she corrupted others. Yes. Okay. This has been going on. And what also is taking place here, if you'll note, that the Lord is saying, verse 19, I know thy works and char charity and service and faith, and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou... Who is the thou? It's the leadership of the community has allowed this to happen. Mm -hmm. Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Eat things sacrificed unto idols. The Luciferian mercantile system is infiltrated the communities. Right. Things sacrificed to the gods, the Luciferian uh, nations on the outside, are now influencing the saints on the inside. So we should understand that the leadership will also pay for Jezebel being turned. Yes. Because previously she was without blemish. Yes, they failed to uh, take authority over her, restrict right. her, right. isolate her, or kick her out of the community for what she was doing. But she wasn't necessarily part of the leadership. No. 
Okay. She was an individual that had a high stature, stature in the community, but the inference is she's not part of the community leadership. Right. Because he says, you, thou, has allowed her to do this. So they have authority over her, always had authority over her, and they allowed it to take place. Was she a prophet? Yeah. Okay, it says right here, yeah. yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the, the inference is she felt real, real heavy because um, she becomes uh, totally um, somebody that wide open to uh, satanic influence mm. using every source every means um, the Luciferian mercantile system her seducing people to the power that was once uh, holy in her now it's a power that's Luciferian totally to uh, amass a following for herself and the Lord's using this as an object example after the rapture during the tribulation period to all the other churches they're going to know what took place, they're going to see the suffering of the people that followed her, and it's going to affect them to turn and repent during the Great Tribulation period. 